you all for being here. Welcome. I am Celeste Watkins Hayes, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. I'm also the founding director of the Center for Racial Justice at the Ford School. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you here this evening for today's Policy Talks event with our partner, Wallace House Center for Journalists. First, I want to acknowledge my partner on this event, Lynette Clemenson, director of Wallace House. Lynette cannot be here with us tonight. She is in El Paso, Texas, for the legal conclusion to the 15-year asylum saga of Mexican journalist and former Knight Wallace Fellow, Emilio Gutierrez Soto. As many of you in the audience may be aware, Emilio's life was threatened in his home country for doing his job as a journalist and as a champion of press freedom around the globe. Wallace House became heavily involved in his case. I'm delighted to share that today, in a courtroom in Texas, Emilio was officially granted U.S. asylum. As a member of the Wallace House Executive Board, I am proud of this work and share the news in admiration of my colleague, Lynette, and her tireless advocacy, advocacy that was life-saving for Emilio and legally meaningful for other journalists who are forced to seek asylum here in the U.S. Now, let us turn to today's wonderful event, this discussion between Carrie Swisher and Mary Barra. I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for the event, the University of Michigan School of Information and University of Michigan's Democracy and Debate, as well as our media partner, Detroit Public TV and PBS Books. And a quick word about our format for this evening. After their discussion, my colleague, Dean Andrea Forte from the School of Information will introduce a panel of students who will lead the Q&A and then she will give closing remarks are two extraordinary speakers. Kara Swisher has interviewed literally everyone who matters in the world of technology for three decades now. The ups and downs of Silicon Valley companies, the newly minted billionaires, the mind-blowing innovation that has changed our world for the better and sometimes for the worse. She looks back on many of those people and events in the instant New York Times bestseller, Burn Book, a tech love story. I'd also like to mention that she has served as a Livingston Awards judge for Wallace House since 2014. When she agreed to come and speak, she said she wanted Mary Barra to interview her because the auto industry represented exactly the kind of legacy business that is navigating the innovation landscape, which has important lessons for Michigan and for the country. Mary Barra is now in her 10th year as CEO of GM. She's the only female to run a global automotive company and is the longest serving female CEO of a, Fortune 5, of a Fortune 100. She took the job at a time when GM was still recovering from bankruptcy. Morale was incredibly low and the company felt like it was barely surviving. She has changed the culture within GM to put an unwavering focus on safety, which remains deeply embedded to this day. The last five years, she has focused on creating the vision and building blocks for the future, investing in an all-electric future with the creation of GM's own platform, Alt Altium. Relevant to this discussion, she believes that investing in a platform will underpin the transformation and be a key for future growth. So now let's welcome Kara Swisher and Mary Barra to the stage. Thank you all for coming. Well, first, Celeste, thank you for that introduction. And thanks to University of Michigan and the Wallace House Center for Journalists and the Ford School of Public Policy for hosting us tonight. And let's welcome again, Kara Swisher. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, uh, my favorite thing about Kara is she drives a Chevy Bolt. I do. I know. So, I know you're going to do an I'm ad for a Chevy that. Bolt. I'm excited about that. But let me be clear. I bought it myself. You had nothing to do with nope. it. Nope. And I love my Chevy Bolt like I shouldn't love an object. I really love it. I sit in it all the time, and I'm very pleased with it. So it's a very nice purchase. It was inexpensive. Um, and I love it more than my Kia. I can't believe that because I love my Kia. So there you have it. Thank you. That's the ad. I'm even more excited. Yeah. Uh, no, but I, I'm also, uh, this is the first time I've really gotten to do this where yeah. I'm interviewing you. Yes, apparently. Good luck. S yes. So. <laughs> Because I but, have some questions, but go but, ahead. Uh, I've, I've had the, uh, the privilege to be able to read the book, and uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, I think they're going to have an opportunity to buy books at the end of it. I would strongly encourage, I learned so much, and there's so much content. I think we're going to run out of time, especially because we want to make time for your questions, but uh, the amount of, uh, of material and your frankness and candor, it's just, it's an incredible book. And... Uh, Topping the New York Times bestseller and is That's one of the right. best-selling books. So congratulations! Yes. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm in. A, I was surprised, but I kind of tried to figure out. I'm kind of an entrepreneurial personality, so I was like, "How can I get on the New York Times bestseller list?" And I totally engineered it in a weird way. But now RuPaul is kicking my ass. So there you have it, and deservedly. Well, I'm, hey, I'm fine. I, I I would be you know mid bestseller list or you yeah. know, just have a book would be great. So don't, yeah, I, I yeah, think yeah. it's You need great. to write one first. <laughs> there you go. But again, this interview is also part of the Democracy in Crisis series. And when, when you think about everything that's going on in the world and what you cover, I think uh, this is going to be a really rich discussion. So let's go ahead and get started. And, uh, you know, when, I, when we look at uh, what the book it has a history of tech, but it also has your personal story. So I felt mm -hmm. like I really got to know you. So I hope we're going to get to explore yes, please, a little yeah. of that as we go forward. Yep. Just so you know, uh, uh, Kara graduated from Georgetown with a journalism degree and, and a literature degree and got her master's in journalism from Columbia and also spent time at Duke, uh, where I actually sit on the board of trustees. So uh, go, go Dukies. And um, you also talk, talked about what was important in your studies is how propaganda and misinformation mm -hmm. was a concern and a focus for you. Yeah, it was always a concern. I'm too, interested in two things. One is media as it evolves over the years from like carrier pigeons to, to, you know, to the Gutenberg Bible to radio, television, and the impact it makes. And same thing with cars. Like cars aren't just a it aren't just a car, it would change the world. It changed the way people lived, small towns. Like, what does every technology do for society? And so I was more focused on that. And I think a lot of previous tech reporters were much more focused on the inside of a watch. Like, what's inside the watch? I don't care what's inside the watch. What I was interested in is what time is it? Mm -hmm. What time is it? And I know it sounds dumb, but it's a very different idea when you, when you do these things to understand what you're coming from. Because I think all technologies, whether it's the, the spear or the knife or whatever, changes societies mm -hmm. in some fashion. And, when I, and especially media technologies over the past hundred years. And you've seen you know, what radio did uh, for, both, for both Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler, right? It's different people. They use the technology in a different way. Um, television, the same thing. Um, whether it was John F. Kennedy affected right. politics very significantly, uh, or any number of things of how we looked at ourselves. And when the internet came, when I saw it for the first time, it went click, 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 because I had studied the uses of propaganda in especially Nazi Germany and in China and in uh, uh, all over the world. And sometimes propaganda could be used for good things. You know, war, you know, often in the war, during World War II, there was a lot of stuff like that. But it was almost always, in fact, always used for bad, always. And so I was super concerned about, when I saw the internet for the first time, the possibilities of usage. And again, as I said a number of times on this book tour, look, Stalin did not need Instagram right, to kill all those people. All, all these autocrats, Hitler, whatever, they didn't need Snapchat, they didn't need Twitter or whatever. But if they had it, what would be the difference? And I think you saw that, you've seen it, Rich Large, because he's still around, Donald Trump using social media for his, per his political purposes and to speak directly to people. And then the, especially now the right is doing it more than the left, it, which was using this sort of, because they had le been left out of regular media. I mean, the regular media was largely 
I would say center left and right. right. I, I, think, right. I think that's pretty, it's not mm -hmm. true that it's very, if you've worked in any news organization, you know the owners are not what I would call liberal. Um, and so uh, I think what, what was interesting about it was that the right had been largely left out of regular media, mainstream media, and so they created another first Fox News and everything else. And so that was interesting to me, how they were using it and, and, and abusing it, using the tools that you might use for good things. And so it immediately attracted me. But, but with that study, you could have easily gone into more of a public policy uh, type role. How did you choose, you know, so since we have public policy and journalism students, yeah. how did you choose journalism? Um, well, by accident, actually, because I wanted to go in the military. And uh, for those who don't know, there's probably a lot of young people here, you couldn't if you were gay. You absolutely couldn't. And at first it was, you got arrested for it, or you got kicked out and was discharged dishonorably, which was heinous. And then during the Clinton administration, it was don't ask, don't tell, right. which was almost worse in mm -hmm. some weird ways, which is mm -hmm. I asked and I told. And so it's like, I'm sorry, I'm very chatty about the situation <laughs> of my being a gay person. Not that I want to talk about it 24 seven, but it's part of my, me. Who you are. And so I wanted to, my dad was in the military. Uh, he, they paid for his medical school and his college. Um, my, I have a lot of family members on his side that were, I had, an, uh, I had a, a great grandfather who was an admiral. Um, I would have been an excellent admiral. I would have been running the Pacific Fleet right now, and you would all be safer for it, by the way. Um, and now, wait, I, I have to ask you that, though, because you know, throughout your book, you yeah. had choices to go work where there was big tech companies, but yeah. you kind of said, I don't really want to answer to someone, so I don't know about the military. Think, Help I think me I resolve good. that. No, I would have been like Maverick, like, you oh, know, okay. always a captain. Okay. Like, and then he's saying, you know, you're washed up Maverick. And he's like, but not today. Like I would have done shit like that, you know. And then I would have, you know, won the day, essentially. So, although I have terrible eyesight, so I couldn't have been a, a Navy pilot. Um, uh, but one of the things, you're right, in that regard. But I think, I, I, I think there's, a, I gotta say, when I meet military people, mm -hmm. they're some of the smartest people you're gonna meet. Absolutely. I have to say, it's sort of a canard. Some of them are, like, I've talked to so many interesting people. First people who alerted me, to risk AI risk from China was a military person, like early, early on. It's where I got my, a lot of my, that was the first place. It's often, they're very attuned to things at the high levels um, and, and highly, um, highly important to the thinking of our country because we have a, a democracy that actually, where the military is subject to, which is unusual around the world in a lot of ways, not everywhere, but in a lot of places. And so I think I might've been good. The reason I didn't take the tech jobs, one, sheer stupidity, because uh, I would have been really wealthy, and I would have probably made this auditorium, would be the Swisher Auditorium, <laughs> like, it would have been great. Um, and, uh, but I, I, my, uh, my ex-wife did, she worked for Google, she had been at a company called Planet Out, which she did a great job at, and then she was an early Google person. I, I had urged her to go, she wanted to go, she got to know Larry and Sergey, so she did great. Um, but, um, but I just didn't wanna, and she's from MIT, she's got all the qualifications for doing so. And I was offered jobs like editorial director at Amazon, I was, or all of them had an editorial director job, but none of them cared about media. So it was hard to take a job like that, although, Every now and then, Ted Leonsis, who owns like 14 sports teams right now, um, would send me the amount of money I would have if I had taken the job he had offered. And he's like, oh, it's up today. Like, and you're like, you know. Well, no, I yeah. think you straight to, stayed true to your course. So I, I think guess, that's really... sure, why and, not? And so, <laughs> trying to give you credit here. No. Um, I would have been able I, to afford the lyric. Anyway, sorry. I, 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 I do, I actually do believe uh, you, you followed your true heart. Okay. Uh, but, so, you know, chose journalism and then met Walt. Yeah. And, you know, it's clear, you know, that he was a mentor to Mossberg, you. And, yeah. yeah, and, uh, and very, a very important person. Can you talk a little bit about how that relationship formed? Because, I mean, you kind of, you know, encourage each other, but then, you know, really broke new ground together. So yes. can you talk a little bit about that? Well, one of the things, Walt Mossberg, who the book is dedicated to, and is, I think, one of the most entrepreneurial journalists, and you certainly knew him because he, he mm -hmm. wrote a lot about, everybody knows him as Walt, essentially. Right. And one of the things he did, he was covering the State Department, he was covering the Defense Department, and he shifted to cover technology very early on in the early 1990s, which was like, to me, a career ender. People thought it was, and of course, he ended up being hugely successful. Right. And one of the things that was interesting about him was that he was always taking chances on things. And one of the things he did is he did amazing reporting 
And then he came to a conclusion, which I think journalists weren't doing. They were pretending they didn't have an opinion, they, not even an opinion, an informed, reported analysis. So we would, we would not tell you what was actually happening. We'd tell each other and never tell. And Walt told people, I tried this product, and this is what I think. And he also liked and disliked things, people both, but he liked them too. And so I thought that was a powerful thing after doing reporting. And so when I, got, when I was writing my first book about AOL, um, I met him, and he and I were just like mind meld like this. And both he and I thought media would be destroyed by the internet. We really did. We saw it coming. I had already had those feelings. Um, I used to I used to use the cell phone, but the, the post had one cell phone and a suitcase. I used a thing called a trash eighty, a TR. You probably remember the TRS eighty mm -hmm. uh, with couplers. I was very interested in why we continued to have a teletype machine. I used to yell at it all the time. I'm like, what is this doing here? I get the you know I get the all the president's men end of the movie, but <laughs> otherwise it's useless because we're going to have computers. And so I was, I was worried about classifieds. And so when I went, Malt, Walt understood the transformation digital was going to make. And almost nobody, in, I would say nobody in the industry who was running it for sure, but even reporters didn't understand it, and he did. And so that's probably why we had a mind melt in that we saw it. And then in understanding that, we knew we were screwed from a business point of view if we stayed in the same paradigm and we had been infected by entrepreneurship. Um, and innovation in a good way. And so we were like, let's try something new in media that people try to make products and focus on the news business rather than just the news. We, we wanted to understand that if you, if you had a good business, you could do great journalism too. And if you didn't, you were gonna get screwed by what was the, the trends that were coming down, so. No, I, I mean, when you think about, uh, you know, you were early on in realizing that everything is going to be digitized. Right, yes. And, uh, I kept saying that. People yeah. thought I was crazy. I would, I'd sit there and I'm like, why are you doing that? Like, I constantly sing. At the journal, when they wanted me to write uh, earnings reports, you know, you know, this today, GM made blankety blank. What I didn't do GM, I did tech companies. But uh, I was like, why am I writing this? A computer could write this. It's just numbers and they could just, if you program it in, why are people wasting their time? And they'd be like, go sit down and write that. You know, and I, I'd argue with them about, like, uh, they had, at, at, at the journal, I had moved to the journal from the Washington Post because I was super worried about the Washington Post because I had covered retail and all the local retailers had died. And I thought, there's an economic problem for this company. And then the classifieds were getting eaten up by Craigslist and news was free. And so they didn't have enough products, I think, that were worth it to buy. And they didn't think of adding value to their subscribers. Like, why would you pay for something if it wasn't worth it just for what, charity? Or, you know, that's not how people think. Um, I don't think they buy your cars for charity. Like, no, oh, I want to They're very rational. Help. Yes, they're very rational in how they make their decisions and choices. And I think I had a lot more respect for the audience than some people who are running it. Like, in terms of they're paying their hard-earned money for these things, we've got to provide them with things that are worthwhile. So Walt and I really, I was particularly nervous at the journal, which I thought was on a higher floodplain because of business people just, they, right. their business is paid for it. Um, but I was still worried that they were focused in on print a lot more than they should have been. And this was way before now, because this was, right. you know, and they were obsessed with it. And I said, well, you need to take all your money and put it into digital and hire tech people and start to reward them the same way. And they just didn't want to. And at one point, I, I think I tell the story in the book where, they, they had a meeting, and I was the young person, right? And I'm old now, but I was the young person at the time. And they had a meeting of how to get people to read, how to get young people to read the newspaper, you know, that meeting, like, honestly. Um, so it's all like old people talking about right. this, which is always like, why don't you ask a young person, right. essentially? How many of you read the newspaper? Yeah, read it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. a handful here, yeah, but all right. It's fine if you do. I don't care how you read it. It just right. was people were reading it a different way, and they didn't want to shift. You can read it, you can read it on salami if you feel like. I don't care. <laughs> And by the way, I'd sell it to you if that's the way you wanted it, if I could make some money doing it. But, um, but they really were against it. And so I was in this meeting, and they, they grudgingly had me there because I was an irritant, which, I was by, which I'm supposed to be as a reporter, so I found that curious. And, um, and they said, uh, well, how can we get young people to read the newspaper? And I put up my hand, and you could see them going, oh, no, what is she going to do? And I said, if you tape a joint between every page, <laughs> that'll work for a little while at least. <laughs> and they, they were like, get out of here. They literally kicked me out. They're like, get out of here. I'm like, okay, 
I think it's a good idea. Like, you know, it's innovative kind of thing. But illegal. It's still free, so it might be a problem too. Yeah, yes, illegal, it, illegal and, at the yeah, time. Yes, now it is not, of right. course, but anyway. So let's shift gears a little bit because, uh, you know, you uh, tragically lost your father when you were five, but I think it, if, I think it's really important to share how that shaped your life and shaped the decisions yeah. you made. So one of the best speeches, if you ever want to see it, is by Steve Jobs. He, he did it. He was, he, Steve was sick and then not sick. People don't realize there was a period where he actually got better and recovered a little bit for quite a long time, actually. And then he got sick again. Um, and he gave a speech at Stanford during the he'd just gotten better period of his life. Um, and he, it was all about death. The entire speech was about death. It was some, it's something else. If you've never heard it, you should read it because it was beautifully written. He was a very good writer. And, he, and, and the speech itself, him telling it, is amazing. And so one of the things that I really clicked with him on was this, uh, not obsession with death. I wouldn't call it that because that's kind of creepy. It's... Um, it's an awareness of death. And so when you're aware people are going to die, including yourself, which you all are, by the way, just FYI, um, just to give you information, I was always formed by my father finishing the Navy, had three kids, got out, and then died, just suddenly, 34 years old. This is when the life was beginning. He finally got some money to buy a house, and it was done, that was it. And so when I was five, and my brother was 10, and my other brother was three, so slightly less affected, my younger brother, but still, um, I have small children, they're downstairs, and I also have older children, one of whom goes here, I'm not supposed to mention, but he is here, go blue. Um, and he's great, he's an amazing kid. Um, but w it really made me realize when my oldest son turned five, how affected I was. It was the mm -hmm. first, I was like, oh my God. And now, of course, you know, my two-year-old knows me. And so it, you really are, tight with your parents. And so I was always aware of time ticking mm -hmm. constantly. And it was in a good way for a, in a bad way to learn it, I guess. That, I learned it in a bad way, but it was a good thing to learn. Right. Because I think that really informed how you made made choices and how you want to live your life. And I mean, when you think about being purposeful. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't call myself purposeful. That's a nice word. I like all those books that are written like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, find purpose. And I'm more like, I don't got time. Like, I'm like very much, and I get formed by like Woody Guthrie, which is, you know, I, I get a track, there's an app on my phone called We Croak, which I recommend. It's, it's supposedly if you hear, get five sayings about death every, uh, every day, that you live better, you're happier. This one is, having no destination, I am never lost. Iku, Iku, okay, okay, anyway, okay, that's not a death one, but it sort of is, yeah. uh, meaning there's no point to life. That's really, I think that that's saying. Um, <laughs> But it is, there isn't, just so you know, there isn't, there's not. Uh, but I think it just gives you an urgency. Right. And it also, right. it helps you, very, very similar to tech people, I don't have time right. to stay in a job I don't like, I don't have time not to do what I wanna do. And I'm right. not talking about in a selfish way. It's, I don't have time. And so it's always, whenever I want, I'm doing something I wanna shift, I do it, and I think it's absolutely from this experience because it, you just literally don't have time. Like it's like there's, my next book is about this. It's about this and a lot of what healthcare and tech and longevity is going on. Right. Um, and it, there, there is a number of days you have to live. You just right. don't know what it is. And right. so I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing to be aware of it. And so I happen to learn at a young age, everyone at some point, probably when they get an illness, mm -hmm. that you sort of get that. I had a stroke that also reinforced it, which is like, after that, I didn't have any time. And so right. after that, I kind of accelerated my entrepreneurship and quit things when I didn't like them, so. Well, I think there's life lessons in that for all of you uh, at, of how you live your life. Yeah. And so, very important. But it can lead you to really selfish things, too. Like, I'll say what I want. Like, no, you, I don't mean to be crude. Don't, don't say, although I have a tendency to say things, what I say forthrightly. Some people would say rudely. Um, but I was in a, something I didn't like, um, and I didn't like the people I was working with. I just didn't like them. I just, it's, it's fine if they didn't like me. I don't, it's just I didn't. And so that was my determination. I didn't like what I was doing. And the person said, well, why are you leaving? And I said, do you want to know the truth? And there, which is kind of a mistake to say yes, if you say that to me. <laughs> and it's like, clue, clue. don't say don't yes. Don't say that, right. I said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And they were like, what? And I said, you've taken up far too many of my minutes and I really would like it to stop like now. And then I left and it was fun. And they were like, oh, and I was like, yeah. 
you, I don't want to talk to you. And that's another 30 seconds I've just lost. So, I, yeah. I know, I shouldn't I, have done I, that. I, I say that to myself, I'm going to start saying it out loud. Do you say that? Ta there's times. You can't, it'll get, we it, all have it, those it'll times. become a Wall Street Journal story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Mary rude, and, question mark. You know, and you, you're uh, someone who got to spend uh, incredible time with Steve Jobs, and uh -huh. you know, I think from the book, know him really well. Any, I mean, obviously his, his view on life and what's important, any other learnings from him? Yeah. Well, he was a difficult person too. I, I, I try not to leave that out. I think it's very clear that he was exacting as a person and as a leader. And I think one of the things that people get lost is they focus on the visionary aspect. I think he was a good business person, right? He was really good at shifting and changing. Um, he did many interviews with us where one time he took some dongle out of the side of, a, a, of, a, of an, an Apple device, a computer, and everyone lost their mind. I think it was to put the little disc in or something. And he was like, I don't like it. And he took it out. And we asked him about it. Everyone was in tech. They lose their minds. It's, it's weird. It's, they just go crazy if you do something. And he, they go, we go, Why, how'd you decide to take it out? He goes, I didn't like it. <laughs> and they, we were like, did you talk to him? He goes, I don't care. They don't have to buy my computer if they don't want it. I don't like it. I think I'm right. I'm going to go this direction. He was very much like that. And right. Decisiveness is very important. Not stupid decisiveness, but he trusted his instincts as a leader and what he wanted to design. And one of the things I appreciated about him was, you know, he could have been, well, by the way, Apple is now the biggest company in the world. I think Tim Cook gets a lot of the credit for that. It's 10 times as big as when Steve died, which is everyone's like, can Tim Cook do it? I'm like, it's $3 trillion. I right. think he did it. Think, like, yeah, exactly. I think he's good. <laughs> like, right. And he also, they created the, uh, the watch, the AirPods. Right. They're all big businesses right. and they're creative in a different way. And um, so I really appreciated that, the ethos of that company and that it stuck to its, it stuck to what it did. And when it didn't do, th and I think that's really hard for companies. You're sort of like, I mean, sure, the car industry's got to be like, what do we do? Where do we go this way? Do we do that way? And you get pulled into directions that are the correct directions, and you get pulled into directions that are not the correct directions mm -hmm. that you go in. And I think they did it, I think, I can think of one time Apple did something that was out of their wheelhouse that they shouldn't have done, which was the ping. Mm -hmm. You don't remember? There was a social network Apple had called ping. They had one before that called City something or other that they killed off, that AOL ran actually for them. But that was super early and it would cost like $3, so it didn't matter. But they had a, a, a social media network called Ping and it was focused on music and so they had this event to introduce it and they brought Chris Martin in from Coldplay and they had him play and the Ping, fun. And so I looked at it and I was like, this is terrible. This is a terrible product. And they weren't good in software then. They've still got some software issues, but they've gotten much better. better. They were hardware people. And so they were chasing Facebook and MySpace at the time, and they never chased people. And he comes out, he used to come out uh, to the, the demo area, and they introduced a bunch of things at that time. And he comes out and he finds me, because I know social networks, right? And he goes, what did you think? I go, it sucks. And he goes, it does suck. And I go, mm-hmm. And he goes, I should kill it. And I said, you should kill it. And like, it was like, it was interesting. And I said, plus, Chris Martin, oh my God, he's so exhausting. And he's such a whiner. And he goes, he's, he goes, he's a good friend of mine. I'm like, okay, then I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah, good, good to know. Good I to maintain know. he's a whiner. I'm sorry. So, so, spe oh. so speaking of uh, Coldplay God. being at his conference. Um, he was at the Sphere, I think. But go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I, I, That's I've cool. Heard of it. I yeah. still don't even want to watch Chris Martin's Sphere. That's how bad I don't like Chris Martin. <laughs> uh, but, but that's not the oddest event you, I'm sure you've been to many you didn't write about, but there was a specific baby shower. Oh, yeah. That was fun. Maybe. So one of the things tech people do is that they're aggressively, uh, uh, they're, they're performatively joyous they like, and wacky. They like to be wacky. That, you must have visited a lot of these campuses. Like, are you kidding me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I just, I want the one where I can get free M&Ms, but okay. Okay. All right. Yes. That's fine. Like, whatever. I can buy my own M&Ms. <laughs> we're this giving them free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're giving them, you know who doesn't, who charges for things? Apple. Apple's an adult company. Like you go there and it's like you start to walk away and they're like, you need to pay for your food. And you're like, oh, wow, I can't believe I can't have the free kombucha made by the people you, you brought in from Kuala Lumpur, whatever. They always had like crazy stuff at Google. It was just like so ridiculously costly. But they had the money, so who cares? Um, but um, this was a baby shower for, so my ex-wife Megan, who's amazing, um, was, uh, was there, was working there, and so I, every now and then, and I covered Google, and I stopped covering Google once she rose there, 
but I went to a baby shower for Sergey Brin and Ann Wojcicki when they, were get, when, when they were having a baby, their first child. And so you walked into this warehouse in San Francisco and there were pictures of them as babies. And I was like, oh, cute, that's so cute, that's a cute idea. But then this woman comes up to you, there's a bunch of them, and they always have these people, these helpers in Silicon Valley. And they're like, would you like a onesie or a diaper? And I was like, what? And they go, would you like to wear a onesie or a diaper? And I said, neither. Neither I would like to do. What kind of party is this? Like, is this more interesting than I thought? Because um, I used to hate to go to tech parties because they were just so performative. And they had people dress up either in onesies or diapers. And with the diaper, you got one of those bo baby bonnets, a baby bottle, and big glasses. And with the onesie, you got a rattle and something else. I don't remember. Whatever. It was just ridiculously weird. And I said, no friggin' way, and I ran in. And I ran in, and a girl was chasing me, and I was like, I'm getting in there without the ones. <laughs> I go in, and there is literally a big ice sculpture of a woman um, who, is, uh, who has Kahlua, a white Russian, coming out of her breasts, like breastfeeding, that you would put your cup. You know, Ann Wojcicki just sent me that picture, and she goes, in case anyone doubts you, here it is. Here's the naked ice sculpture. With her, with her it was disgusting. And so, though it was delicious at the same time. You'd think, so, you'd think she wouldn't want to document it. She but, would, okay. but she did. She wanted yeah. to make sure if anyone doubted me. Yeah. I was like, I knew I was right about that. Thank you. I, uh, I didn't take a picture at the time because it was early. Phones didn't have uh, cameras in them that many. And so um, the only person that was not, now Sergey Brin goes by on roller skates in a onesie with a, with a rattle, and then all these other famous tech people. Wendy Deng, the then wife of Rupert Murdoch, was wearing a diaper with leather pants and stilettos. That was weird. Um, and then people were jumping up and down. They had a, a bounce house. These were adults, OK? And then they had food that was baby food, like, hey, eh, have, some, have some pudding. And I was like, <laughs> I like pudding, but not that much. And, um, and then and Pop-Tarts. There was a lot of Pop-Tarts at this party, now that I recall. But Gavin Newsom was the only person not wearing any of these clothes. And he was mayor of San Francisco. And he's like, how'd you get out of it? And I said, dignity. And uh, he goes, <laughs> and I said, how'd you get out of it? And he said, I knew you'd be here. You'd somehow get a picture of me and report it. And then I'd never be in politics again because I was wearing a diaper because a billionaire told me to. And I said, I would have done that. And he goes, I knew you would have done that. And then we drank the white Russians and that was the party. So. Like there was a party like that every freaking. They would hire Devo. They would hire Elton John. The, it was craziness. It was, it was always some fun thing. One, I'll tell you one more. One guy, I'm not going to say who it is, but I'll tell you later because you know this person, um, was hired, kept yeah, calling me on my phone saying, come to my 16-year-old's my party. And I was like, I'm not coming to your 16-year-old's birthday party. How ridiculous. He goes, oh, please come, come. You'll love it. I'm like... All right, so I drove my little car down to, uh, I think it was a Subaru at the time. Um, of course it was, a Les Baru. Um, and so I drove it down at the, at the time, and I get there, and Maroon 5 is playing for his 16-year-old's birthday party, right? Maroon 5. And I don't like Maroon 5, another band I don't like. And, and he goes, what do you think? I said, well, you better have some money for therapy for your kids someday. Yes. Like, what are you talking about? A 16-year-old birthday party playing Maroon 5? Anyway, whatever. Right. Good luck. I, I just, when and you, you read, wonder I mean, why Elon Musk is crazy. Well, when you, it, it just, it's kind of like when you think it can't be more bizarre, it got more bizarre. It got more bizarre. Right. It did. It, got, it has. It's gotten toxic now, actually. Some of it was funny with the, like Google and their crazy multicolored bicycles. Like, okay, whatever. You want to have bounce houses. You want to, and the food was, but, but what it was was juvenilization of adults. And I think I have that scene with Excite where they had a slide. I refuse to go down. They had a slide between floor two. Did they make you do the slide? You never I, went. I did not do that. Yes, you did not do that, right? So they make you take a slide between floor one and floor two. And, and they were like, take the slot, Karen. I'm like, I'm not taking a slide. I'm 39 years old. I'm not taking a fucking slide. You're no fun. I go, yeah, I'm no fun. That's right, I do stairs now that I'm an adult. And they would like, they, were, they all took the slide and you're like, are you, I didn't like it at five. Why would I like it at 39? Right, right. Like it was weird. Anyway, and I don't like slides to this day. I'm sorry, I'll stick, and stick with it. Um, but they were like that and it was fine when it was harmless, I guess. And I think what happened and, you know, Facebook had, uh, uh, I think Brandy who works for you knows, had these zip things, these weird zip whatever the hell they were, they all had toys. And my kids at the time loved it. My older kids loved it, because it would always be like, I'd take them, because they'd have plenty to play sure. with. 
but it was adults. And I kept right. thinking they're, they're juvenilizing adults and they're juvenilizing particularly men. And they gave them dry cleaning and medical and everything. And I thought, what, are they, what kind of people are they making here? Because they never have any problems everywhere in their life. And that, that started to bother me no, that quite makes, a bit. That makes sense. So changing gears, uh, you've known Bill Gates for his whole career. Yes. Uh, a complicated person. Very. And, but, you know, I think someone you've now come to have an appreciation for what he's doing. Can you talk a little bit more yeah, about that? Yeah, I think, look, let's leave aside his very bad judgment on getting on any plane with Jeffrey Epstein. But uh, let's, I'm sorry, we have to. You can't not address it. It was like a lot of tech guys went down there, by the way. I don't think, I don't, I'm not saying anything happened. They just had bad judgment around that guy. A lot, a lot of people had even worse judgment. Um, but he has moved into... Um, climate change tech and vaccines and stuff like that. And so it's hard not to look at some of the things both he and Melinda are doing. Let me give Melinda equal credit around the vaccine stuff and the healthcare stuff. He's doing climate change by himself, but she and he were the real drivers to a lot of our quick vaccine stuff. He has suffered for it um, in terms of people thinking he's putting a chip in people's brains, which is crazy. Like, he literally has to say, I'm not putting a chip in people's brains. And I have to say to people, he doesn't want a chip in your brains. It's like nutty what's happened. And that's because of social media disinformation. So in that regard, I think that's pretty admirable. I think they've deployed their money in ways that are very helpful to the world. And they should, by the way. Um, and they have also led the way for philanthropy for a lot of wealthy people, them and Warren Buffett. There's a couple of people who are really quite generous. And I would say probably the Gateses and the and Warren Buffett and some others are doing a lot of stuff. Now, at the same time, they're incredibly wealthy and some of their wealth is, it's not ill-gotten necessarily, not in the case of, well, you know, it, it, they're rich people, but they have a duty to give back. And I think during their lifetime, it's better than after they die. Um, others are less generous. Um, the other thing, the climate change investments he's making are very important, I would say. He's at the forefront of like at least a half a dozen various efforts. And I don't think he's ever gonna see the money, nor will his children. I think he's not giving his children most of his wealth. Both of them aren't. Um, and she also is doing all these incredible investments in women in tech, um, doing it through her, her firm. And I think that's, and, and the, of course, the winner of all this is Mackenzie Scott, who is Jeff Bezos' right. ex-wife, right. who is just showing them all how it's done. Like, I love her. She just can't, she just like calls Pan Parenthood and goes, here's $100 million, bye. And it's leaves. <laughs> like, I love that. And like, they're all mad at her. Like, if you talk to the really rich people, they're like, she doesn't do it with organization. I said, you're so jealous of her. It's fantastic. Because she that. just is like, she doesn't have to make a big organization. She doesn't, she's just literally like, you. You get $20 million, you get 50, and by the way, you get 100. Like, I kind of like how she's doing it mm -hmm. because it's sort of just, she's just giving away the money to good, I don't think she's given them to non-established organizations. I think she's really, she's showing you you don't have to make, like sometimes tech people make a performative effort. I, I think Mark did a little bit about Newark when he was giving the money there. It was a lot for show. I, I think I'm glad, I, I'm not glad he did it. I think, I don't know how they made that decision, but I think a lot of them do it for show and for performative. Again, I use that term a lot, and she doesn't. I, I really have a lot. She's a terrific person. I, when I knew her, she was great. And by the way, integral to the founding of Amazon doesn't get credit. She was there early Absolutely. on. From day one. Same Paul thing Marks. with Melinda, very yeah. important character. So you mentioned Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. Uh, you've had a lot of, you have an infamous uh, uh, interview with him. Yes, uh, several. Yeah, he should never it. talk to me. <laughs> I bet he would if he called him right now. He would not talk yeah. to me. He would speak to me, but he wouldn't like to do an interview. It's just like, I think he's had two really, he's had one that was okay because Cheryl was there to make sure things didn't go awry. And then he had one that was disastrous, which he sweat very profusely. That was not my fault. And I saved him, and honestly, I saved him because I made him take off his sweat, his right. hoodie. So in that case, he owes me my feeling, okay? I, agree. I actually agree. I agree. Don't you agree? Yeah. I didn't sweat. That was him, right. like, right? His mother came up to me. She goes, she has, a, she has a very New York accent. She's like, Cara, the Zuckerbergs sweat a lot. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she's like, can I tell you about it? I'm like, rather not. It's okay. Don't need to know. She's lovely, by the way. Um, and... Um, 
And so he sweat in that interview, and that got a lot of attention because of the physical nature of it, and he sure. did look like he was gonna faint, which would have been a disaster for my career. Um, wouldn't it be funny? Like, I killed one, finally. <laughs> I said I didn't. Temporarily. <laughs> Temporarily. But you know, it would have been mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation with me, and no, and the whole thing. I was like, this guy is not gonna faint on my watch. Right. No, ha not happening, no way, no how. And so I actually, uh, Brandy gave me that hoodie. I'm gonna auction it off at some time, one of those hoodies. And so, um, so on the back, inside of it, there was a whole weird Illuminati, Facebook's community, it was weird. There was a weird symbol on the inside, which was disturbing. Um, did you do give those out? I uh, know. GM? Yeah. yeah, right, you just have like whatever. Just a GM. G G yeah. yeah, GM, that's it. On the front. Yeah, well they had stuff on the inside. Community, communicate, it was weird. It looked like the Illuminati. But the real disastrous interview, I think, I think that was just, he was, had a panic attack and wasn't feeling well. And I, I didn't, neither Walt or I felt good about that interview because he, he, we weren't asking him questions that were particularly hard. He just, he had a panic attack and that's okay. It was a young guy. And nobody likes that. Nobody, it's not a good thing. And, but what was, I think, a disturbing interview for me was the one we did a couple of years later. I think it was 2018, it could have been 2017, where I went to Facebook headquarters. And one of the things I like to do is interview people at their headquarters because they feel safe. Um, and they aren't safe. If they're, if they're, they're like, they feel like, oh, I'm in my place. Uh, Kara can't get me here. And I'm like, oh, that's my favorite place to do it. <laughs> I have no, a dream. Note to self. No, note to self. Don't let her go to GM to do the interview. Um, I, I want to interview Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago. That's where I want to do it. And I want to do it in the lobby, and I want to do it with velvet ropes and a big comfy couch, and then he'll feel real safe. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. Right? And be like, I got her. I'm like, oh, you don't. <laughs> don't let the hyena into your house. So, so anyway, so he... Um, so he was, he, I went to headquarters, headquarters face, their new headquarters, which are very cool, um, and we did an interview. And it, and it started off us talking about Alex Jones, who I think is possibly the, one of the most heinous people on earth. And he had been accusing the Sandy Hook parents of act, that they were child actors, just a heinous person. And he, uh, and we started arguing because Alex Jones kept breaking the rules of his platform over and over and over again. And my whole premise was like, why do you have rules if you let these heinous people break them and then you say, but free speech, but why have the rules in the first, just don't have rules at all and just say this is a, this is a shit house and this is what we're gonna do. This is our business, is, is toxicity at scale. And so he was trying to, you know, he was trying to do his, he really doesn't know anything about the First Amendment. Let me just be clear, he didn't. He didn't read it or something, it's short, it's first, I felt like he should. But he was making the decisions about this stuff, right? And so that's why it was like, you need to take him off. Well, we don't believe in censorship. I'm like, censorship, he broke your rules. Like, let me show you the rules he's broken 78 times. Well, we have a secret formula. I'm like, why is it secret? It's like, we know when we blow a stop sign, if they get caught, we get caught. Like, everyone knows what a stop sign is, as though I, perhaps I blow a few every now and then. You, you're not gonna catch me do it, but that's nonetheless, it's, it, it's a rule, right? And everyone else must abide by them. There's consequences. Usually, not always, but mm -hmm. most of the time. At least you understand the right. rules. And so, um, so, and I thought he was particularly damaging at the heart of the problem that was growing on Facebook, which was misinformation at scale. And it's really propaganda at scale. And no, no governance. And he was, Facebook was not paying the cost of the damage it was doing. So its business looked a whole lot better. You know, if you didn't have to put in airbags and safety and everything else, you could have a fantastic business, right? Like everybody has, every industry is regulated except for tech. And we'll get to that in a second. But um, so he was going, he, I was asking about that. He felt very uncomfortable because he wasn't on good ground on that one. And he said, look, let's switch to Holocaust deniers. And I went, oh, that's a mistake on your part, I thought to myself. Because one, I was a Holocaust studies person in mm -hmm. college, so I knew more than he did about sure. the topic. And second, which he didn't know for some reason. And then he, he was doing, he's Jewish, and he wanted to do this, even I as a Jew, that he was using that, and he said that to me. And I said, okay, go ahead and tell me about this. And he, and he essentially said, Holocaust deniers don't mean to lie which I thought was not true. And so in that moment, I think I took, a, it was a really interesting moment in the interview because I tend to speak up and my speaking up voice in my head said, you are a fucking idiot because they do mean to lie. That's their whole game is they mean to lie and degrade people 
and they lie about a historical event, and they mess up facts and fiction, and they create all kinds of havoc. This is what they do. This is their job, is to be heinous, essentially. I use the word heinous a lot, but it's true. Um, and so it's a good word. Um, and, and I didn't say anything, because what I wanted to do in that interview, and sometimes it's better to say nothing sometimes, because I wanted people to hear his theory, largely because I wanted people to hear that he was entirely unqualified to be making this decision. So it was very important for him to spool it out for everybody what he was thinking. And what he was thinking was so ill-formed, so uneducated, so wrong, and born of no debate. And I know they had internal debates about it at Facebook, but they really sh these people shouldn't be making these decisions, right? And I wanted people to understand that, and he did. And it was really quite something to hear. And, and he got in big trouble for it. And the minute it was out of his mouth, my producer, his name was Eric, and I were like, oh my God, did he just say this? And we ran out of that place and posted it right away, because I wanted people to see. Like, and so my whole premise with him is that he, he, was, he is unelected, he is unaccountable, he is unfireable, and he has a profound effect on our society. What in the hell is going on? Like, you need to understand. Now, two years later, he did exactly what I told him he should be doing, which was removing Holocaust deniers. Two years of toxic waste and anti-Semitism, which has been around since the beginning of time, but it's amplified and exposed to so many more people. And the whole premise of a lot of these tech people who literally took First Amendment 101, or First Amendment for dummies is really what they have. They, they were not talking about the First Amendment. They're talking about hate speech and, what, and the implications, and they weren't paying the price for that hate speech. Wherever it, it, it same thing around um, January 6th. I wrote a column talking about, um, in 2019, where I said, Donald Trump's gonna lose, if he loses the election, he's gonna lie about the election and he's gonna keep telling the lies and it's gonna go up and down the food chain of right-wing media. And then he's gonna ask his followers to actually stop the election from being finished, like from being approved. I wrote that in 2019 and I had Facebook call me and yell at me, I had Twitter call and yell at me, because I called them handmaidens to sedition. I said, these people are handmaidens to, they're not causing it, but they're creating an amplification system that we have to figure out what to do about it because it's, it's, it's where everybody gets their news. And like the New York Times can't do this. They get sued. The, New, the CBS News can't do this. But this is a broadcast network that, that cannot get sued. You can't sue them. You can't have any liability. If your child has something that happens to you when you smoke a cigarette, you, used to, you could sue them before the warnings. You can't sue them. You can sue you. I'm sure you, you're subject to dozens and dozens of lawsuits. Very regulated. Right, very regulated. And so what is, where is the, where, why is there no regulation on the one industry that's the most powerful industry in the history of the world? That's really kind of fascinating because we're going to jam their innovation? No. No, it's not true because guide rails are critically important to this. And I'm an entrepreneur. I don't like a lot of stupid regulation. But more than zero is something I would prefer, like for these people. So. You would too. <laughs> You'd be like, yes. So, so we're approaching an election. It's uh, speeding down the tracks right now. It is. Indeed. If you could change one thing as it relates to what, how Facebook it's manages. It's like Groundhog Day this election, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But, but, but if you could do one thing, if you could do one thing between you know, what, what Twitter, Google, Facebook, what would you do? Like they do in Europe, shut it down for the month, two months before the election or something. They have, they have I forget what the rule is particularly, but shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, it's, and I, we weren't gonna do it. We aren't gonna do it because it's free, you know, free speech kind of thing. But it's really, if you understood how many malevolent players are manipulating you, you're not getting free speech. This is right. not, you're getting something else. That there are so many malevolent players now they're out, you know, there's the Washington Post saying is democracy dies in darkness. Democracy dies in the full light of day. That's what's happening now. And so I, I'm not one of those catastrophizing people either because I think we are completely with skills to fix it. And we have a, we're a resilient country. We really are. We've gone through, you know, y'all don't remember the Whiskey Rebellion, but I do. Like there's been a million of these things, right. Salem Witch right. Charles, Whiskey Rebellion. The Civil War, someone was like, there's been no time in the world like this. I'm like, the Civil War is right up there. I feel like, yeah, yeah, we did that, that we did that. Like sometimes we get sort of in this 
we have such a lack of history in this country or a memory of history that you're sort of like, yeah, we've been on the edge many, many times. McCarthyism, it goes on and on. But I do think that I would, I would somehow get, you can't get them to do anything. If I could, they would, sh they would shut down political, ad like political ads and, and, unless they knew the provenance of everything and put them on there so people could know, everybody would know and re media could report on where everything was coming from. Um, during the, when Hillary Clinton was running against uh, um, Trump, uh, there was a whole series of things on Facebook I started to see where, uh, I think I've told the story before, but Hillary was a lizard person from another planet, apparently, and it was under her skin, like their lizard oh was, if you scratched her, you could see it, like the scales. I know, right? Yeah. That was up there for a while. And I called, I think it was Cheryl or one of them, I said, Hillary's not a lizard, you know that, I've scratched her, she's not. Like, you know, and, and I haven't scratched her. I didn't do that. Too. She'd clock me one if I did. Um, she's a funny lady. Um, and, uh, and right, by the way, very right about a lot of stuff. If you go back and look at a lot of her speeches. Um, uh, but she was a noisy lady, so, you know, you don't want to listen to her. I have to say, if you go back and listen, she's like dead on correct, which right. is really interesting. Um, and, uh, and so I tried to get them to pull that down. Maria Ressa in the story, the woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize, was getting attacked badly in the Philippines by Duterte, who was just an autocrat and a murderer. Um, and, and she brought me all this data she had brought to Facebook people. And uh, I, uh, she said, can you, they're not listening to me, maybe they'll listen to you. They didn't listen to me. And everything she said that she had the data on about the use of social media and the, and the, uh, 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 the, the manipulation of it was true. And it took years for them to do anything about it. Myanmar just goes on and on and they never pay the cost of what it costs, right? That's my whole thing. Like, I don't think they're, fu they're fully responsible for January 6th, for example, but I know who paid for the cleanup of the Capitol. That was you and me and taxpayers. Right. They didn't. Right. They didn't pay. For, they didn't pay a penny for it, really. And, so and it's not, they're not the a, only problem. For some, it was a huge cost. Well, hopefully, they'll take your advice. They so won't. we've got to transition to uh, to some questions from students. But before we do, let's quick uh, do a speed round. Mm -hmm. So, what reporter do you admire the most? Walt Mossberg. What news outlets do you read most? Um, I read everything. I'm, I'm a much, I read obviously the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal and stuff like that. But I read widely. What's really great about the new media environment is all these voices. It's really interesting and they're building some really interesting businesses, small businesses. Um, you know, Puck and um, I read widely. I read, and then I read, I, I used to use Twitter for a um, news distribution because I think they did a good job at that. But now I can't go on there because it's so toxic and nasty. I see you've avoided Elon at all costs, um, but um, actually I had it. I didn't get okay, to it. Sorry. All right, okay. I, um, but I see you did that. What, Very uh, deft of you, Mary. So, uh, <laughs> what was your favorite interview? Oh, interesting. Steve, all the Steve Jobs interviews. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates interview that we did together. Yeah, that, yeah that's that, historical. That I think in history that will go down in history as an important interview. I thought they're the two iconic people of the age. Um, I very much liked an interview I did with Monica Lewinsky many years ago because I think she's a really interesting character um, and is the, probably the only person in that whole saga that didn't drop a dime on anybody and she was a 19 year old girl and I think she's done a lot with her life that it's, she, she really has and she's, she's a very wise person whose life has been utterly changed by a stupid mistake she made when she was 19 years old. Lesson learned everyone. Lesson learned. <laughs> Um, yeah, don't what sleep with the president. What, <laughs> what tech founder do you admire most? Which tech who? Which tech founder? What found, what? Uh, many years ago, I would have said Elon. I'm going to actually talk about him um, because he was doing big things with, you know, a lot of tech people are big thinkers doing small, small ideas like a digital dry cleaning service or something like that. It's exhausting when they come to you with some of these ideas, you know. <laughs> Like, we're gonna do, you know, like, sh they come and change your sheets. And I was like, that's analog. Like, it's just right. done on an app. It's not digital. Like, right. you sit there and you're like, after the 20th one, you're like, oh, I'm gonna just have to leave this profession right now. And Elon was very inspiring in terms of the Tesla stuff. I don't, he wasn't the founder of Tesla, for people who don't know. He was, right. he's a very good business person. Um, and uh, it's been a huge, that's why I call him the most disappointing person, because, you know, even, even his, you know, the SpaceX stuff was super interesting. Again, there's a lot of people there, not just him. He tends to take all the credit now for everything, but it's not, he's not 
always the one person. So I would say him, except now he's just a terrible, how things have gone wrong is he is the personification of that to me. Jesus complex, uh, incredibly divisive, angry, um, victim, victimized, feels like he's the victim when he's in fact the victimizer. Um, and has really lost the narrative of something that possibly could have gone really well. I like a disruptor like that, but now he's a destroyer, I think, in a lot of ways. And that's, that's disappointing because, you know, no one's inherited Steve Jobs' sort of mantle. You don't need one necessarily, I guess, but no one's inherited that. True, true. And my last question. Sure. Who's going to play you in the movie of your life? <laughs> Mary Barra. No, um, no. I don't know. Who do you think? Who would be good? Probably Holly Hunter. Uh, we're thinking Kate Winslet. Oh, I'd like that. That yeah. would be great. I met her at the Today Show recently. I was talking about all this stuff, and she's doing this great show called Regime right now. On she's ter she's so terrific, and she literally came over. She goes, "I like the way you talk," and she hugged me, and I was like, "And my life is over." That is <laughs> Oh, well, and that, I, I said nothing about the door, which I'm obsessed with in Titanic. I'm like, the two of you could have gotten on the door. <laughs> Technically speaking, he didn't need to die. But yes. I guess for the movie, he did. You, know, so you could go on and ride horses in Arabia or whatever. <laughs> did you see those pictures at the end? She was, anyway, sorry. Well, I like it. I like it. So I think we need to move to student questions. I think we have someone. Yeah, there we go. Are you going to read them or coming up and do it? Them, but okay. I'm going to thank both of you. All right. So I'm Andrea Forte, I'm Dean of the School of Information, and I just want to thank both of you for this fantastic conversation. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to stand on stage with such amazing humans. Um, and I just want to share a little bit about how the School of Information, uh, it, this, this really resonates with what we do. Um, we're researching and teaching about how we can build and use technologies in ways that make information a force for social good. And so this has been an incredible conversation for our students and faculty, many of whom are in the audience tonight. So thank you. Um, and so now we will welcome the opportunity to hear some questions from University of Michigan students who are representing the School of Information, Ross School of Business, Ford School of Public Policy, and our student newspaper, The Michigan Daily. So our first question is from a School of Information PhD student, Jane M. Hi, uh, this is a question for Kara. Mm -hmm. So in your book, you succinctly wrote about the dangers of social media and you briefly discussed today. Mm -hmm. um, currently, there are many attempts to reimagine social media in industry and also in academic research. What do you think is the most important angle for us to think about to make a move forward in the long run, but which hasn't been discussed enough? Of, um, for example, would it be enacting more stricter privacy policies or rethinking social media's business models, actually creating novel social media from the ground up with thoughtful design, et cetera? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good question. I think there's two things, and it's about any part of technology, including cars, by the way. Um, I think you have to design with safety in mind, and one of the things, points I make in the, in the book is that a lot of the reasons a lot of tech is not safe is because the people who designed it never feel unsafe as people. They are in a position of where they don't feel unsafe, and it's just, that's just the facts. And if you meet them, you'll know this, right? They don't understand. When I was at Facebook at one point, when they did uh, Facebook Live, I was like, oh, what about bullying, uh, uh, mass murderers who put on a GoPro, this and that. And the person who was designing it was like, you're a bummer. And I'm like, the human fucking race is a bummer. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry to assume the worst, but I think I will. I think we'll start with the worst and then get to the, to the, the Chewbacca mom. She's great, but like I'm guessing there's some bad people are showing up. And so I think more of a, like, a, like I think all engineering students should take philosophy, history, et cetera. I think they have to. They have to be widely read, that's one. Um, you know, whatever you think of Steve Jobs and Apple, privacy has been, had, was that's thing one, because I think he had a much bigger sense of things. And his business model was around selling stuff, not, not stealing information from people. I think we don't have any privacy, surveillance, everything. It has to be legislated that there are, there's real teeth around anyone who surveils us in any way. 
Um, secondly, real teeth around privacy and data and algorithmic transparency. These are, these are some of the bills that never will pass because tech doesn't want them to. And tech has slid in into the center of a dis highly dysfunctional political situation we have. Cars didn't make it. Pharmaceutical companies get regulated. Airlines, when, when that airline, um, uh, I, I say this a lot I, because it's just the most recent thing, when that door blew off, 750 planes were grounded investigations, people were fired, lawsuits, none of which tech has to pay for. And, and, and they just don't, they don't, they're, they're, they're not liable for some of their activities. So basic laws, federal laws, the only laws that are being passed are in Europe. By, I just did an interview with Marguerite Vestager, who's driving them crazy because, and fining Apple to it's 0.6 billion. Maybe they'll win, maybe they'll lose, but they get their day in court, right? Like that's, you know, even Donald Trump was in court, he lost, that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes in, for every one of us. It doesn't go that way for tech. And again, they're the richest people. So that's another way. Another way is to, is to um, involve more than just uh, the engineers in charge of tech. It has to be a wider ranging management system where more people don't, they're not just, they don't have to just listen to people. Um, the, the immense power, I mean, and I don't think absolute power necessarily corrupts, but it sure seems like it does in a lot of ways. And so, you know, when, when, when Elon Musk is making decisions about Ukrainian uh, geofencing, I feel we've lost the narrative as a country, right? I'm sorry. Uh, you know, or a VC is telling us about how to do, or, no, not VC, this is uh, Bill Ackman, is, 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 is lecturing us on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd like him to sit down, honestly, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. But we let him do it because he's rich, right? And he has rich friends, and they all think they know better. And I just, I, listen, I do really well in media. I make a lot of money. But I am not going to lecture him on hedge fund investing. Like, I, am I going to do a multi-part series about hedge fund investing on Twitter? No, because I'm not, I'm not that arrogant. And so I think we really have to start to really reset our, uh, that we let people who are just because you know, there's often like with Elon, they're like, well, he's really successful and therefore, right? You know, like I had Mark Benioff on stage, whom I like very much, by the way. And he said, well, you know, Carrie, he can land a rocket on a surfboard, right? Like that's the kind of thing, like, wow, amazing. I'm like, yeah, but the anti-trans, anti-Semitic promotion really is a problem. Like they can't separate the two. Like right now, I'd love to see Henry Ford today. Like it would be a little more controversial than what a guy. Right, you know, because of because he was a deep anti-Semite. Like, like, he's a professional anti-Semite, as far as I can tell. You know, and and the stuff he promoted. So that's the kind of thing. Is why do we have to? Why can't we uncouple those things and really be honest to people? Um, and and I think probably I would, if I had to pass one bill, it would be an antitrust bill. Honest, I think that's the thing. Is antitrust has not been updated in years. And, and Senator Klobuchar from here from Minnesota is, has been stymied over and over again. And I recommend a book she's written on antitrust. It's really big and fat. It will kill a poodle if you throw it at it. But um, it's a great book. It's a great book. Antitrust, the big corporations are not keeping us safer. The reason we have cell phones is because AT&T got broken up. The standard oil would be run in this country if we didn't do, you know, they just would. So I think some things like that. Seems logical, right? Great. Thanks so much for that question, Jane. Our next question is from Sharif Almaki from Ford School of Public Policy. Hi there. Um, so I'm glad you kind of breezed by it, but you talked a little bit about DEI um, as an issue. And so many of the names that we've talked about tonight um, and that kind of tend to rise to the surface in the global commons tend to be powerful men, and especially white men, right? Really? We talked about Gates. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that's a surprise, but uh, Gates, Bezos, uh, Musk. So structurally speaking, uh, and Mary, I would love your input on this as well. I mean, you've broken a lot of barriers to get where you are. Structurally speaking, what is keeping us from having a more diverse slate of names in these conversations? What needs to change? And in particular for both of you, who are the leaders in these spaces that you're looking at? as exciting for the future. I'll start and then you can oh, talk please. about this. So I don't think Gates is one of those. I, I think he's actually quite different. Bill is not, doesn't do that. Um, definitely Elon and definitely um, Bezos has been sort of sideways on it. He's busy on a yacht enjoying his midlife crisis. So I think he's busy <laughs> doing other things, but correct? 
I didn't hear him. Oh, I said Jeff Bezos oh. is busy having a midlife crisis that looks like so much fun. Um, and, uh, and he was at the Oscar, but whatever. Enjoy yourself, Jeff. Because um, he's now the world's richest man, by the way, because uh, Elon keeps fucking up. Um, but um, but uh, I, I, it's really interesting to me that they engage in this, because most of them don't know what they're talking about, which is, of course, that doesn't stop them. They're frequently wrong, but never in doubt. And, um, and one of the things that drives me crazy is there, this idea of diversity, equity, inclusion, which they've now trashed. It's been, it was a plan by Chris Rufo and the rest of them to do this, to find, the, like, parental rights was another one they pushed, um, most of whom don't have children, but they're telling you how to have children, which I'm always fascinated with. But one of the things that, um, if you look at the opposite, now I think the word is trash now, so unfortunately it is, and I think people are cutting back, and it's hard because, especially when there's economic problems, it's the first thing to go. But imagine the opposite of diversity, equity, inclusion. Take each of those words, because words matter. Diversity, homogeneity, that kills civilizations, just so you know. Diversity is what creates great, strong civilizations. Equity, unfairness, oh, that's the American way. Let's be unfair. Uh, that's the opposite of equity is unfairness, un, unequal uh, places. So unequal, okay, good, that that's really sounds great. So homogeneity, unequalness, and exclusion. That's a really great way to run a country. You cannot run a company like that. So the one person I would say, and Mary can finish, Mark Cuban has been doing some amazing posts on this and the effect of DEI um, on on his companies, and he's being very smart and strategic in that he talks about his experience and what he didn't do and what he does now, and he talks about the pluses and minuses, and he wants to have a real debate about it in terms of what's good, what's been overstepped, which some of it has, no question, so what? Like, you can fix it, right? You can fix your, and go, but it hasn't been, but, the, but what was happening before was worse, and there's been some overstepping. So he's been talking about it in a really smart way. He went over and did it at Twitter, which I was sort of like, I wrote him, Godspeed. Good luck, man, you're not coming back, but good luck. And I think he was trying to have a, a good faith debate about it, and then Elon, of course, this is Elon's response. You're a racist. You're a moron. Boobs. That really pretty much was his argument, right? Like, I'm gonna make a boob joke. And you're literally, like, you have no interest in a good faith argument about an important topic. You have no interest. And you need to shut up. Like, that's the kind of, if you want to have a debate about it, that's one thing. But if you don't want to have a debate, you need to sit down and shut up. And, or you just want to make trouble. And I think, I would say Mark Cuban recently, and it's important that people like him, people that he looks like them, is important for him to do it. Because I think it has more, unfortunately, more resonance with certain people. I think when you said, you know, the opposite of DEI is, is not a place anybody wants to be, but I, I talk a lot about it, GM, about inclusion. And how many people have been in an environment, in a club, at work, where you felt like you were excluded? It feels pretty crappy, doesn't it? So, you know, when you talk about creating, a, a, whether it's a country, a company, why would we go around making people feel not valued, that you don't care about what they think? I mean, so, to me, it's respect. And, and valuing different points of view. I mean, the, the art of debate and being able at some point, and you put this in your book as well, and every now and then you just have to agree to disagree, mm -hmm. but have the discussion, because that's where the richness comes, and that's where you get different perspectives. So, uh, I also think it includes a lot of other things besides, it's often pushed on race and gender at this point, but it's, it's also, con I interviewed a ton of conservatives. I just did a great interview with Mike Gallagher, with Ken Buck. Ken Buck is the last person on earth I would agree with, but boy has he turned out to be, you know, he's doing, he's quitting and he was very, very resonant on this is not a stolen election. That was, talk about how difficult that was for him to do. Um, so I think it's really important to get as many allies as possible in this because they're very well organized on the other side, they really are. And they only want to, they literally want to destroy if you listen to what they're doing. Um, they, want to, they, want to, they want to separate people and people are easily separated. They are very easily separated. So, and then with social media tools and tech tools, it's even easier to separate people. And you have to listen to, you know, tech will either be a tool or a weapon. We have to decide which one we want to use it for. Thank you for that question, Sharif, and these wonderful answers. We have three more questions. 
The next one is from Genesis Grant from the Ross School of Business. Hello. All right here, how convenient. Yes. Hi, so this question is for Kara, but we would love your opinion on this too, Mary. So in the tech slash innovation space, we see the birth of new companies, but also the importance of their leaders' personalities. So as some of the names we mentioned tonight, Elon Musk with Tesla, Zuckerberg with Facebook, or even GM with Mary Barra. So as someone who's interviewed all of these founders or leaders, what do you think about this trend and what does a responsible future look like for these companies with such strong CEO identities? I'm not a big lover of C big CEO identities. I get it. And I'm like, look, automobile industry, Leah Coca. Remember that? Like, well, oh, I wrote a book, everything else, whatever. Um, I, think, I think we tend to overestimate our leaders and underestimate everyone under them. And, and you'd, you, have you heard of Gwen Shotwell? She's running SpaceX. That's who's actually running SpaceX. She doesn't want to be known as that because she likes her job, but, um, <laughs> but it's a woman who's running SpaceX and doing all that work, the real work of that company. And some of it's really amazing. A lot of it's really amazing, actually, and really quite breathtaking. Um, uh, but, you know, I think, I, I think there's too much of a, of a, a it's Scott Galloway on our pivot calls it the, the, um, the idolatry of innovators and the idolatry of rich people, and I think it's a mistake. There's, and I don't mean like, let's all clap for uh, you know, essential workers, which I thought was great, but there are so many people involved in success of our country that do not get shouts outs and stuff like that. And I think it's unfortunate that we have to, in the, in the wake of lack of heroes, we make flawed people heroes of ours. I don't, I don't understand why we can't celebrate more widely and more, you know, we, I, it's something in the American psyche. I don't really know if that's the thing, but you know, we treat a lot of these people like they're like a savior. And let me tell you, they're not gonna save you. They really aren't. And one thing that John Stewart said in a recent thing is that at the end of the day, it's us that has to change it because the voter, like we have to stop focusing. You know, it's easy to sort of, Trump, what's he gonna do? Like, it's us that has to do it. You have to get out and vote, you gotta organize, you gotta stop pretending like losers or winners. You gotta stop, um, you have gotta stop, like, at some point, it, it is within your power, because you do live in a country where you, you, well, it may be unfair, maybe all kinds of things. Go to other countries that don't have this ability to do it. You have a lot, as young people here, you have a lot of choices. You have a lot of choices that you don't have to make as opposed to many other countries where nobody has a choice. And you have to sort of take that and not just rely on, you know, there's good and bad CEOs over the years. There's good and bad leaders. There's just, there's no way around it, but you cannot rely on them to make decisions that you are within your power to make, at least the ones that are with your power. I don't know what you think. I, I just, I, I mean, it's all about the team. I mean, the team is what gets it done. If, you know, from the person who, for our business, putting the car together to the designer. So it's, at GM, it's about the team. Right, and so one of the things, I do notice that women CEOs say that's the team often, and men CEOs often, it's like, well, it's me and those people, um, which is interesting. See, she just did it. Um, but it's true. Um, they're it's not, true. It's, it's true. true. They're not as self-aggrandizing, I'll tell you that. Um, there are some, but it's a really interesting thing to watch. Um, there are other leaders who are, like I think Satya Nadella at Microsoft is really quite an astonishing leader there, has been really smart and he's, he's got a lot of humility and um, he, in a lot, if I had to pick a tech CEO, he's one of the ones I would say is one of my favorites because he's, he understood, he came up from the bottom and he, he, he doesn't have to do jazz hands all the time um, to show himself off. He's in that company's now worth what? Three, three and a half trillion dollars. Like he's brought up the price so high and on quality stuff, he made the right investments in open AI. He's, he's really, um, and he himself, now there's a good example. He's an adult and he has, he has a very difficult, he has kids who have learning disabilities and he's got a full life. And so he has more of a perspective on, on difficulty. He's also an immigrant and, he just has a lot of, I really like him quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Genesis. Thank you for the answers. Next up, question from LSA student and Michigan Daily reporter and editor, Rachel Mintz. Hello, um, 
thank you both so much for being here tonight. It's been wonderful hearing from both of you. My question is probably aimed mostly towards Kara, but for either one of you. It is about Kara, so that's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so from your perspective, after writing Burn Book, how do you see the rise of artificial intelligence impacting the technology and EV industries? Yep. Do you think it is an overall positive force? And if so, what guardrails could mitigate concerns about malicious uses of AI? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to really rethink things because this is supercharged. If you think the internet was damaging, get ready, right? The things that you could do, um, and I, I don't turn to me, I talk to real AI researchers like Fei Fei Lee, Jeffrey Hinton, all these other people. I happen to like Fei Fei Lee. I did an amazing interview with her. She's, an, she's one of the early AI people at Google. She did ImageNet. She's amazing. You don't hear from her as much, hear about her as much, but she's really quite a pioneer. Um, she's just written a book, it's quite good, I recommend it. Um, but one of the things that I think about is someone's like, are you scared of AI? Now, there's a lot of sci science fiction ideas about this, like it's Terminator. Everyone's in the Terminator movie for some reason. And so you have these techno uh, catastrophe, techno decelerationists who are like, we can't do it because it's going to kill us. And I had one person call me and say, if you don't care, if you don't stop Sam Altman, humanity is doomed. And that wasn't Elon who did that. But I'm just saying, it. although he says that, right? He does, because he's a drama queen. But, um, but like, I was like, he, it's not because of Sam Altman. Like, that's not, like, it was, I was like, that's the plot of Terminator, and I am not, uh, I'm not the lady with the big gun in Terminator. I'm not going to be shooting Sam Altman any day of the week, this week at least. And so I think it's really important to think about the bet, to focus on the benefits, which are myriad, um, uh, you know, cancer research, um, uh, medical stuff is just astonishing. Education stuff, climate change, um, everything can be transformed by these technologies. It takes all the information and takes it back. Doctors can't know all the information. They can't. Just yesterday, there was a story about this kid who had this disease. They inputted it into one of these AI, a good AI medical LLM, a large language model. And, it, and for years, doctors couldn't figure it out. It knew it in two seconds. Like, that's a lot of money to save, right? There's, like, there's kind of all kinds of cool things that could happen. Um, for AVs, it's critically important. If we're gonna have, you know, I'm a big proponent of AVs, and I think all these car companies have to lean into EVs. I think uh, even though consumers aren't there, it's directionally the way everything is going and has to go because of the crisis of climate change. Um, you have to invest, I know it's hard, but you're gonna have to do it. And safety. It's, uh, okay, and safety. We are. But you're gonna have to keep going, I'm sorry. It's a valley of death, I get it, but too bad. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but and AVs, I'm a big proponent of them um, because I, I know everyone's all mad in San Francisco, but uh, let me just tell you, people are the problem with driving. Like, I'm sorry to tell you, I do sound like Elon Musk here, but it's, th the problem with driving is there's people in cars. That's really the problem. I'm sorry, but you know what I mean? It's, uh, so AVs are really interesting to me. And once you start to deploy them on the road, you must have advanced AI. For, it's so complicated. But one thing I do know about AVs, when an AV gets in an accident, it's never getting in that accident ever again. When I get in an accident, I do it about six times. Like, okay. So that's one of the things I think is important. So that's the positive. There's the, you could, I don't even know all the things that are gonna happen. I just don't. I can definitely think of the bad things in two seconds. Uh, killer robots, killer drones. Uh, m use of misinformation. What, the, uh, what, what if on the day of the election they say one of the candidates has died and it gets out really quickly? Um, and then it comes back, P the, the media comes back pretty quickly, but not fast enough, right, to suppress voting. Um, you could have uh, Biden for the age thing, which he seems to be very lively now, so the, the Republicans made such a mistake. They're like, weekend at Bernie's, and then he's not, and then they're like, wait a minute. Like, that was an interesting thing, but what if, say, an AI just made him seem a little older, just slightly, just with the, with the videos? They could do that, uh, 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 and, and I would say Trump seemed crazier, but that's really hard. He kind of does, it, does a good job himself. Um, sorry, I don't care if you're for him. I don't, he's crazy, um, but, um, but uh, bloodbath. Um, so it's in the car industry, though. It's in the car industry. Did you see that stupid excuse? He picked his words exactly the way he wanted to say them. Um, he's incredibly smart at social media, by the way. Um, so I think there's all the bad things you could think of. And so what we have to do, and I think, again, at the heart of this book is the Paul Virilio quote, when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck, when you invent um, planes, you invent the plane crash, you invent electricity, you invent electrocution. 
we, as I've said a million times, we've had a lot of ships and a lot of shipwrecks, but no lighthouses. Where's the fucking lighthouse? That's what I would like to know. And so that's what I would like to focus in on with this, that we have guardrails in place. And I thought the Biden administration executive order was pretty good, but it can't be an executive order. It has to be congressional action because that's their job. And so as much, I don't like executive orders particularly much. I think that's the wrong way to govern. And um, so there has to be a bunch of guardrails in place and they're pretty obvious. We can agree on um, no killer robots, perhaps. Perhaps we can all agree on that. We've done it with nuclear war. We've done it with, I mean, with nuclear weapons. We've done it with cloning. We do it all the time as a global, and it has to be global. Uh, because with the issue isn't AI, it's the bad guys using AI. And let me tell you, they're there and they're here and they'll use it because that's what they do for a living. What do you think? I don't. No, I don't. all right. Nope. One last question. That's right. One more question. Thank you, Rachel, by the way. Uh, from Akila Mulapudi. Hi, thank you both for coming. Um, I study technology innovation and regulatory policy, so this is right up my wheelhouse. Okay. So my question pertains to the recent passing in the US House about a bill to ban TikTok, a really okay. popular social media app. I'm aware of it. <laughs> I think we all are. In your opinion, is this movement primarily a reflection of anti-China sentiment, a measure for user data protection, or a, perceivement of, or, or a perceived infringement on free speech? What do you think the repercussions are going to be for other social media platforms? But moreover, you mentioned something incredibly important, January 6th. What can we do in the face of the upcoming 2024 presidential election and the challenges that we face with social media? Sorry, um, considering the tools of separation and the lack of guardrails that we're facing, because at the end of the day, it's we who pay the cost to misinformation and disinformation. That is true. Would you like to answer that? I, you know, there's like five in there, so I'm okay. Gonna all right, go. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's not your area of expertise. I have written a lot about this. A couple of years ago, I wrote a column saying I love TikTok. It's the best. This is five years ago. It's the best new social media app I've ever seen, and it's really an entertainment app, and I use it on a burner phone. And this is because I studied China, and, and I, I read what Xi Jinping says. They are our adversary. Whether you like it or not, it's not anti-China. I'm not anti-Chinese. I am anti-Chinese Communist Party, I'm sorry to tell you, because I happen to be a capitalist, and I, don't, I think they're authoritarians. I think they are, and they're a surveillance state, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they are aiming for global dominance in lots of areas. And I got to tell you, the US innovation system, for all its problems, is the best system in the world. Right now, we're ahead in AI. We're ahead in everything in that regard, but we don't have to be. They can immediately, they're very good at this stuff. Secondly, um, we're not allowed to have any of our social media apps in China. That's interesting, right? There's reciprocity, I'd be good with them here, but we don't have reciprocity because they know what we know, which is they're spying on us, or they could spy on us. It doesn't really matter. Everyone's like, let's show proof. I'm like, they could, they could. That's, that to me is all you need to know. And China, and, and we can't be there at all, in any way whatsoever. They keep tight control of it because they're an authoritarian country and that's what authoritarians do, whether you like it or not. Third, they are literally, of course, they're, in, they're, up, in our, they're up in our infrastructure. They're, in, they're everywhere. They're doing it everywhere because that's what you do in a cyber war, which we are at with Russia, with Iran. With, we're all involved in it. And to pretend otherwise, because we happen to like dance videos, you've got to be kidding. Like, they, they of course, are there. And so I think I, 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 it's not just that, but it's propaganda too. And I don't think they're like telling TikTok what to out give. I don't think that's true. I think, but I'll tell you what, when it, if this thing passes the Senate, which it probably won't, so it doesn't really matter, um, they will not give us the algorithm because they can't give it. If, if they give us the algorithm, we'll actually know what they did, right? If we get the history, we'll know what they did. They don't want us to know what they did because if they did anything, and I believe the people who run TikTok don't think that they're being manipulated. But Mark Zuckerberg is manipulating us to sell us socks on Instagram. That's what, or whatever the heck, they're really good ads on Instagram. So that's what he's manipulating. And he should be, there's not, it's not one or the other. We need a privacy bill to stop Mark Zuckerberg from stealing our shit, like our data. I'm sorry, we do. But that doesn't mean that China is better and it definitely isn't. And Mark does make this argument that he should be bigger because of Xi Jinping. I, I was always, I called the Xi or me argument. And he said that to me during that same interview. And he goes, well, it's G, essentially he said, well, it's Xi or me. And I was like, don't like either choice. Would like another choice. <laughs> How about we also regulate you and make sure we're protected against foreign adversaries? We do that. 
Last two things, China could not own CNN. It's a broadcast network. They're not allowed under foreign ownership rules. Now, they've gotten weaker over the past couple of years, but they can't own, by the way, if you combine CNN, NBC, CBS, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's, TikTok is so much bigger, so much bigger. It's crazy. Um, so we wouldn't let them own a broadcast network. I'm not sure why we're allowing them to own a broad, a big, be able to broadcast all across our, it's a broadcast network. It's the new broadcast network and we have to pretend. Now, tech is media, stop it. Stop pretending they're just a benign platform, it's media. And then lastly, kids, you're not losing TikTok. You're not, it's not going away. It is gonna be here. There's all these billionaires who wanna be billionaire more and they will not allow this to die because they're making bank or they will, it does actually make money. TikTok doesn't make money, loses money. Um, but they wanna make money and so you will have your TikTok. That is a false argument that it's going away or that the, the Congress people are taking away your TikTok. You will not, you will have your TikTok. And by the way, in two years, you won't like your TikTok. You'll like something right. else. <laughs> uh, you heard of MySpace? Yeah, that's right. So, so it's true. It's just, but it is, it, 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 there are national security issues. And I, I, I know I, I, there's a Congresswoman, Sarah Jacobs, who's from the Qualcomm family, actually. And she's making a good argument about it. And she hasn't seen enough proof. I don't need proof to think the Chinese Communist Party wants to spy on us or influence us, because we want to do that to them. I know what we do. I know what we've done every time. And I, I've listened to what they've said. And I, if they didn't, I would be so, I would eat my hat if they weren't wanting to, they have to be. And so I think, I'm not trying to be a spy or like this is, ooh, the world is a, is a difficult place, but the world is a difficult place. And you know, Putin is a thug and a murderer. That is it. And the fact that tech people are backing him just makes me vomit, like vomit. The man's a murderer. This, our country is broken and partisan and angry and it's because the loudest voices in the room get to scream. And the rest of us in the middle, are tired of it and we have to stop letting them scream at us and trick us and make us feel bad about things and just demand better rules around addiction. This is an, these are addictive, better rules around antitrust, better rules around privacy, algorithmic transparency, hacking disclosure. When you get hacked, you should know. You know, if something's wrong with a GM car, you know, you, if they don't tell you, they get all, they, that happened with whatever other company, the, the car company, they got in big trouble. Um, everybody, we should know if they're, and everybody, every company that's surveilling us, we should know these things and we should demand it of our public officials and get them to stop with their ridiculous antics that they're doing. And again, like I said, turn the camera on to the people we elect and if they're not doing it, we de-elect them because we can, that we can do. And everyone else, we, you know, I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen to Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, any of these people, but I do know this is, you, this is our country and we have to stop letting these kind of things divide us for just for pure profit. That's to me, that's to me is the, the basic message of this book. So that's my answer. And we are so fortunate to have Kara Swisher, who's holding tech accountable yeah. and saying what others are thinking. You too, Mary. Well, thank you. I'm watching you, okay. All right.